Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Hello and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Dan Maltrip, Chief Executive of the City Club and a proud member. And here in the midst of a continued stay-at-home order, we're presenting a virtual Friday forum from the studios of IdeaStream, our public media partner. In the last two weeks, we've conducted a few forums on the impact the pandemic is having on public health, on state policy, on the economy. And today we're here with County Executive Armin Budish to discuss how Cuyahoga County is responding to the coronavirus crisis. So as in every City Club forum, you get to participate with your questions. You can text your questions to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. And you can also tweet them at the City Club. We'll work them into the program. And as we begin, I want to thank our sponsors and members who have stepped up to support our efforts to continue the conversation in the midst of this crisis. I want to especially recognize PNC and the Center for Community Solutions, who made contributions this week, along with City Club board members Rob Falls, Paul Harris, Mark Ross, Robin Minter Smyers, and Kay Rodolfi. You can see the growing list of supporters for our virtual forums at cityclub.org slash thank you. Those contributions are especially important today and through this crisis as we have sort of honestly lost a lot of revenue that we would ordinarily get from ticket sales and trying to keep the doors open and keep the community connected with our programming. And now to our county executive. Armin Budish is currently serving in his second term as Cuyahoga County Executive. A member of the Democratic Party, he was a four-term Ohio State representative and served as Speaker of the House from 2009 to 2011. County Executive Armin Budish, Welcome. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, welcome back to the City Club it's Forum. My pleasure. Thanks for keeping these forums going, even though you can't do them in person anymore, because, uh, you know, th this is so important to our democracy. It's one piece, vital piece, to have communication and discussion about the issues of the day. Thank you for saying that. And, you know, part of this involved us uh, foregoing or, or promising to reschedule our state of the county with you, which had been scheduled for April 22nd. Um, there's a, a lot of initiatives and, and news that I know you wanted to share at that moment, but none of it sort of seems as important as what the county is doing right now in no, terms I, of response to the crisis. I had been working for actually for a couple months on preparing my talk for the state of the state of the county, and um, it's all out the window. I mean, it was a good speech, by the way, and I'm someday sure was, I'll be happy to tell it to you I'm, over a cup I'm of sure coffee. I'm sure it was brilliant, yeah. It was brilliant, but... You know, this is a different world. We're in the midst of maybe the worst crisis that we've ever had, and certainly in my memory. And as a species, maybe. I mean, this is this is terrible. Uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, the the contagious nature of this illness and the fact that it's a killer combine those, and uh, you know, it, it's it's really awful, and it's having all kinds of horrible impacts. I mean, we, we're staying at home. You know, we're we're missing some of the human contact that's so important to our lives. Um, we're having businesses closing, uh, terrible economic suffering, people out of work. I mean, this this is disaster, and uh, you know, it, it. I've certainly never seen anything like it. We're working very hard in the county. I want people to know that. Uh, virtually every minute of every day we're working on on trying to help the people of Cuyahoga County come through this and I believe we will uh, but but it's it's tough I want to get to exactly what the county is doing in, in a moment I wanted to first note that uh, for our listening audience we are in the radio studio together practicing appropriate social distancing six feet apart and uh, I appreciate you making the effort uh, to join us. And and as Absolutely. we start, too, I also wanted to recognize the extraordinary efforts of our frontline health workers and public health mm -hmm. officials and, and others who are, are really appear to be 
do I know they're doing everything they can, but it appears as though it's having an impact. And yeah. in fact, um, flattening the curve, as we've been talking about for three or four weeks now. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was just at the Board of Health this morning and they were uh, announcing some of the stats for the last week. And something like a third of the people who are testing positive are our caregivers, the people, you know, nurses and doctors and others that are caring for us. So it is, it's, it's tragic, and and people are putting their lives on the line. We got first responders, police, and fire, and you know, our employees at the county. We got the the doctor, we got the uh, uh, sheriff's department, we got, uh, you know, at the jail, the corrections officers, uh, the people who are making sure that. Our kids remain safe from abuse and neglect. They have to go into people's homes and check the kids. And, you know, these people are, are doing, really sacrificing, doing wonderful, wonderful work. And, and I just can't say enough for the people who are out there trying to keep us safe and healthy. County Executive Armin Budish of Cuyahoga County is our speaker today at our f- virtual Friday forum. It's more like an interview in the way that we're doing, approaching these uh, in during the stay-at-home order. County Executive Armand Budish, could you talk a little bit about precisely what the county has has been doing in the past two weeks and has proposed? I know there's been news today about relief for small businesses. Mm-hmm. I want to give you a chance to to talk at length about it. Well, we've from from day even before day one, I mean, we were snapped into action. We uh, probably the first thing we did was set up our uh, emergency operations center, which is the place where. All the, the, the crucial components, people come together. So we have uh, people from our county board of health, the city board of health. We have the first responders represented. We have um, uh, the hospitals represented. E- everybody who's involved in this crisis comes together at the emergency operations center where people can deal with emergencies co- on a coordinated, uh, immediate uh, uh, path. So, so that's the first thing we did. Also, I uh, issued a, an emergency order first day, um, uh, which allowed us in the county to speed up c- procurement, our purchasing, uh, th- basically uh, get around the, the more uh, l- lengthy uh, processes that we normally have to follow in government. And it also opens us up to receipt of some additional grants that are out there. So so those were the first things we have did. But virtually every day we're, we're working on things from, uh, you know, looking out for the people who are most at risk, people in the jail, people who are in homeless shelters. We're, we're, you mentioned our, our uh, plan to help small business owners. I mean, that's something we've been working on for a week, which is not a long time in the scheme of things, but you know, it, it, we had to move quick. So today we announced a, a plan to help small business owners. Um, uh, we're helping people who are unemployed. We're keeping our our normal services going, so our Medicaid for health care, our, our uh, uh, SNAP for food stamps, our TANF for cash assistance. We're doing everything, even though you know we're trying to do it with a scaled-down staff, people working from home. It's much more difficult, but you know we're observing uh, the rules that have been set for us. Let's talk about the Small Business Relief Fund that the county has set up. A million dollars, is that correct? Uh, actually, uh, it's, it's that you're low. I'm low. Uh, so we put in five hundred thousand mm-hmm. uh, dollars. The goal being to set up a fund that could help small business owners get through the next months. You know, where it's going to be very tough when their doors are shut. I mean, you know, you walk down the street. I walk down the street. I look. I see, you know, some businesses that were thriving two weeks ago are now closed, mm-hmm. and. It's terribly sad. I mean, I, it's heartbreaking to see. I mean, I was a small business owner. I, in my old life, I, I operated two small businesses. And I know how hard it is in good times to operate a small business, let alone in times like this where the revenue falls off the cliff. So um, we're trying to be helpful. So we, we uh, created a small business task force. We brought together experts who deal with small businesses all the time, groups like the, the Small Business Administration and uh, uh Cozy and you know a bunch of other groups, uh, and uh, we came up with a plan. So right now the federal government has uh, uh, created small business loans, uh, small business loans, which uh, we want to encourage people to apply for first um, because that's those are big and those are uh, 
uh, should be available, but it's hard to get through the SBA process. So you're talking about the 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 new proposal that the House is voting on today. That's in the Senate package. That's that was correct. The two tr- part of the two trillion dollar stimulus package. That's correct. So those loans should be available to small business owners, uh, but it's hard to get through them. So we're also setting setting up a call center for people to call and get help on how to deal with the uh, SBA process uh, to help them through it. Uh, and also to help them identify other resources. The fund you're talking about uh, that you asked me about with the $500,000, we we created another fund, uh, a local fund, uh, f- to help small business owners both in terms of um, some people won't qualify for the for the federal SBA loan. Some people uh, will fall through the cracks. Some people will need some funds to get through the period until the SBA federal money comes through. So all of those people can apply for our program. Um, as I said, we put in 500000 We We uh, at ECDI, the Economic Community Development Institute, uh, matched us three to one. So that's a million five they're putting in. So that made two million. And then we've uh, already got commitments from some other uh, uh, folks in the community. Uh, so the fund right now is about $3 million. Uh, and uh, we're hoping for, expecting some additional contributions as well. Uh, hopefully, those monies can be ready to go next week. If you would like to ask a question of County Executive Armin Budish, you can text that question to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet it. If you're a Twitter-type person, you can tweet it at the City Club, and our team will work it into the program. Uh, County Executive Armin Budish, the how will are there specific requirements that people should be aware of with the regard to these small business loans that you've been talking about and what and what are the payback terms the loans that the federal government is offering well, appear program, to be forgivable is that going to be the case with these loans as well uh, our program uh, is going to combine loans and grants so the loans will be loans uh, probably no interest uh, but uh, and we'll also have grants available um, uh, ECDI will be administering the program uh, for us. They've administered our small business programs for the last three or four or five years, uh, and they do a very good job of it. Um, other groups, uh, the President's Council and, and uh, Urban League and others are also involved in this program. Uh, and um, as I said, it should be ready to go Monday or Tuesday of next week. You mentioned earlier vulnerable populations, mm-hmm. uh, the populations that have been incarcerated or are currently incarcerated, homeless pop- the members of the homeless population as well. I want to dig in on the what's happening in the jail specifically. I understand that in response to the pandemic, the population of the jail has been has actively been reduced by the work of the courts and by the work of the county prosecuting attorney and others, um, and reduced by about 50 percent. Is that correct? Um, let's see. Uh, reduced by about fifty uh, percent. You you do math faster than I do. So, uh, what what we identified the jail as a real potential hotspot. Um, mm-hmm. Just like the nursing homes and some of the other places around the country have been hotspots. When you have, uh, at the time we started, a couple thousand of um, prisoners, and then you got all the people working in the jail. You know that's thousands of people. Uh, in a very confined space and, you know, easy to, to spread contagious diseases and who knows. I mean, it's, it's really scary what could happen in a jail. So uh, we worked with the uh, judges, both the county judges, uh, Judge Sheehan and uh, Judge Early is the municipal uh, court. Uh, uh, administrative Cleveland judge. Administrative judge. And then uh, Mike O'Malley, the prosecutor, has done fabulous work here and uh, and the city prosecutors and the the local defense bar uh, and our sheriff, uh, Sheriff Schilling, uh, all of them have worked together to try to reduce the population so that that first step is to, you know, reduce the opportunity for contagious disease spreading. Uh, They went from about 2,000, 2,100 prisoners. Today, it's about 1,100. So I think your number is about right. Close, close, yeah. The, um, what's the lesson there? Uh, a lot of questions. Uh, I mean, I think throughout everything we're experiencing, we're we're noticing things that are changing as a result of the pandemic that um, that may carry forward. Is there a lesson here that could carry forward as we think about uh, criminal justice reform? 
Well, the judges and, and again, uh, Prosecutor O'Malley and the others that I mentioned have taken a very careful look at the people who are in the jail. Um, they are being very careful to make sure that violent offenders or sex offenders are not being released. So the community really doesn't have to worry, in my view. I think it's they're doing a tremendous job of identifying the people who don't have to be in jail. And those are the people that they're identifying to get out, either through uh, uh, low-level plea deals or, or bail or, or ankle bracelets or something, where they can feel comfortable that the people they're letting out are not going to go and you know commit a murder or something. So I mean, so they're they're being very good at reducing the jail without increasing the risk to the community. It may, um, it may, in this that information and the and the response, which seems like a very responsible, very response, responsible, um, does raise the question: If they don't need to be in jail today during the pandemic, did they need to be in jail? last month? Well, you know, things have changed. You know, people are looking at things differently today on a whole variety of of things than, than what they did three weeks ago. I mean, this is a different world. And, you know, uh, you know, we it, it, we have been working on bail reform, for example, for two years. Um, this is similar. This is, again, looking at people who don't need to be in the jail. This just sped up the process significantly. Um, we had invited our community to offer questions prior to the program on through Facebook and Twitter and other and other methods. And I'll say again, if you'd like to text a question for Armin Budish, our county executive here in Cuyahoga County, you can text that question to 330-541-5794, 330-541-5794. And related to this issue of criminal justice reform and what's happened, uh, you certainly have more people wearing ankle bracelets, perhaps, the, to um, to monitor their whereabouts and so forth, while um, as they're not in jail. Um, the question from from one of our community members: Will the county waive ankle bracelet fees for people conditionally released from the county jail? Some detainees shouldn't have been jailed in the first place, but lacked bail funds. Others were coerced to take a plea deal for fear of a viral outbreak in the jail. And if not, why not? Um, it's a it's an interesting idea, and you know we've been waiving other fees. For example, um, uh, the governor ordered no personal uh, in person meetings at, at the jails around the state. Um, we in, instituted a program where people could visit uh, by uh, by video conference um, remotely. Uh, there was a fee attached to that. We've waived that fee. Uh, so it's a good suggestion, and we'll look at waiving the other fee. We'll see if we can do that. Um, another vulnerable population that we mentioned earlier is the homeless population. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, homeless shelters, which would be another place where you would fear, as in a county jail, where you would fear that uh, the virus might spread. And right. um, and then there are people who are homeless and not in the shelters who are hard to reach and hard to find sometimes, um, who have are sleeping out of doors. Can you talk about what the county is doing with respect to those populations? Sure. Uh, so uh, you're absolutely right. The homeless shelters were the were the uh, another place that we looked at immediately because, again, when you have a big group of people in close quarters uh, and vulnerable people at that, uh, it's a it's a recipe for danger. So uh, we first set out to try to reduce the populations as we did in the jail, reduce the populations in the homeless shelters. We did that by uh, providing incentives, gift cards and things to families so that uh, encouraging people in the shelters to uh, try to get out to a family or friend uh, and, and stay with them for a period of time. Uh, we also have given hotel vouchers. So again, to reduce the population. And we're going to be using hotels if and when we have to isolate and quarantine people who are homeless. Uh, so uh, all of that is being done. Uh, we're also assessing people, uh, as we do in many of our buildings now, uh, for potential illness before they go into the homeless shelter. Um, so we, you know, our efforts have been successful so far. Uh, we've gone in the men's shelter from 400 down to 240. Uh, we've gone from in the women's shelter from 180 to 125. So we are spacing people out, and we are uh, uh, helping to protect the community in that fashion. So in the case of the, of the men's shelter, those 
that that reduction down to 240 from 400, those other 160 have been moved to family situations or hotel situations, or as you, that's that's, that's exactly what, what's that's happened. What's happened yeah. That's that's very good news. And is there a plan to for the remaining those who are remaining in the shelters to move them to other other scenarios? Well, you know, we'll continue to do what we're doing now. Uh, so the answer is we'll continue to reduce the population as we're doing again with the jail. Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, you can have some in the homeless shelters. You just don't want too many uh, where you can't space them out. You can't uh, you can't have social distancing. Mm-hmm. A large number of the newly unemployed um, are people who had never anticipated needing to rely on government benefits. And um, across the state of Ohio, somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 people have probably uh, applied for unemployment insurance, unemployment insurance benefits in the last in the last two weeks, compared to about six or seven thousand. Uh, in per a month, month or in something the past. like that. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It is. Uh, it is unbelievable. What specifically is the county doing to reach out to these populations? These these are people who have not uh, are not familiar with the way that government entitlement benefits work. So uh, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of uncertainty, confusion, um, lack of understanding about how the unemployment program works. So uh, one thing we've done is I've been working with uh, United Ways 211 uh, to help educate their people and add staff. We've uh, contributed money to uh, help uh, United Way hire more 211 staff to be able to uh, handle these calls. Uh, we're encouraging people to call 211. Uh, they can learn about the unemployment program, who qualifies, who doesn't, how do you apply. Again, anytime you have have a a program like this where people have to apply, there's a lot. It's it's not so easy to get through some of these applications. So we want our people to be able to help them. Uh, And we want people to understand the other programs that are available, the the standard public benefit programs that we provide to people in need all the time. That's Medicaid for health care and uh, uh, SNAP for food stamps and uh, TANF for cash assistance. These programs are available too to a lot of the people who we're talking about here, most vulnerable people now, and unfortunately more people have joined the vulnerable list. Earlier this week we had a virtual forum with John Corlett of the Center for Community Solutions, and one of the questions that came up from a few different points of view had to do with whether or not these agencies are sharing information um, and whether there's sort of a, a seamless flow of information between the uh, agency's tasked with providing unemployment insurance and the agency's tasked with providing SNAP benefits and the agency's tasked with providing relief for housing issues or something like that. Is there anything like that or is that too much to hope for at this this moment? It's not too much to hope for, but you have to remember we also have to protect people's privacy. You can't, you know, agencies are restricted in what they can provide to other agencies or other people. So it's probably not as seamless as we'd like, uh, but um, but there is uh, there are ongoing conversations between agencies to try to help people. I want to switch gears a little bit here to move to two items that are that I tend to think of as part of the un- if oh, one thing ahead. I can add on the unemployment, you know, there's Please. another that was a big part of this federal uh, package that's being passed today probably. Mm-hmm. Um, $600 uh, a month Additional. in addition to a the week. $600 a week. I'm a week. sorry, $600 a week in addition to the approximately t- up to $267 that the state had been providing earlier. Uh, so if you get both, you're at $867 a week, which comes to about a little over $40,000 a year if you multiply it out. And I think that's probably why some of the senators had some concerns about that because. They're, they were saying there's an incentive not to work. Well, I don't see it that way. This is this is critical money that people need who are suffering terribly right now. Uh, but people should know that it's not bad, so they should go ahead and apply. I encourage people to apply. It really is significant. I mean, uh, for a lot of middle class workers, they will be made whole by this by this in increased benefit. Um, there's a there was also concern i think that 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 unemployment that addition to unemployment insurance might encourage employers 
to reduce headcount because to save money by reducing headcount. Well, if if my em- employees can be covered by unemployment insurance, maybe I should re- I should let them let them go and do that and save some dollars for the organization. But on the other side of the the other part of the stimulus bill is that there's these forgivable loans right. for small businesses and nonprofits. You know, you've you've run a business um, and I've run a government and. The last thing most of us want to do is lay off employees. That's Correct. absolutely the very last thing. Um, so I don't see a whole lot of people encouraging their employees to leave. I don't think so either. But, well, I mean, it's a, it becomes an individual decision by individual leaders and, and their boards. Right. The, um, the, I started to move before to the underpinnings of democracy. There are two things at play right now. The census and uh, ballot, and the ballot, the primary election in the state of Ohio. Right. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak about both of those things because I know that the county relies essentially on both. Right. Absolutely. They're both critically important. And I can't s- encourage people enough. You've got to vote whether you have a presidential candidate to vote for or not. You've got to go out and vote because we need you to vote. The the let me start with the census though. You know you've got your census forms. Uh, most people have them. They're in the mail or they're available online or you know you can you can get them. The census dictates how many people we viewed as having in the in the region, and that dictates in turn how much money we get from the federal government, how programs work for us, how how we can benefit from from the federal government programs. It's it's critical that everybody be counted and. You don't have to worry about, you know, somebody using that information against you somehow. There was a concern initially for people who uh, were uh, immigrants. You know, you don't don't worry about it. That, that that problem has been taken care of. They're not asking questions about that. We need everybody to vote to to be counted and fill out your census form. That's well, the, first. And that, that falls to the Department of Commerce, and they are uh, legislatively mandated to not share information out, outside of outside of the census workers. Right. And the other, I mean, I just want to add a couple of points yeah, to that, that, that this determines how many congressional representatives correct. the state of Ohio will have and how those are divided um, in the coming decade. Right. And, um, and specifically, when you talk about federal funds, I mean, you're talking about taxpayer dollars that all of us have contributed into right. this great thing we call the Republic of the United States of America to come back to support this very community. Right. We want to make sure we get our fair share. That's all. But we won't get it if we're not counted. Um, uh, but let me talk about voting. Please talk about voting because it's uh, it, this. There's been so much uncertainty with the uh, you know with the way that the governor very you know very pragmatically and judiciously uh, worked to delay vo- the, the primary days to, so as not to put more people at risk. But um, but there's been a lot of uncertainty about when the quote-unquote election day is and what and how this will all be resolved. So right. please update us. So the, the state legislature has now uh, determined uh, how things are going to proceed, and they're going to proceed by, by vote by mail. There will not be an in-person election day for the primary, but there will be vote by mail. If you've already got your vote by mail, uh, a ballot or application, send them in. You know, it's still time to vote. And if if you haven't gotten anything, get it now. You're not going to be have a place to go on election day, but you can get your vote by mail application, fill it out, uh, send it in, get your ballot, send that in after it's filled out. And when you fill it out, on the very last item is, uh, is um, uh, issue 33. Issue 33 is the Health and Human Services levy. We need that levy to pass. It is critical that it passes. That is the levy that provides basically the safety net for Cuyahoga County residents. That is the the uh, issue that uh, pays for things like um, uh, you know our money to the food bank and uh, our money to uh, protect kids in foster care and our money to uh, help um, seniors and adults services you know protect them from abuse and neglect and pays for senior centers and you know all kinds of things that is our safety net in Cuyahoga County we have to have that passed and so when you get your you got to vote you got to get your vote by mail you got to get it in then you got to go through the entire ballot. Don't just do the top and stop. Do the entire ballot because the last thing on their ballot is going to be issue 33, the health and human services levy. And please vote yes. 
Thank you very much for adding that. The the Health and Human Services, the funds from the HHS levy, the Health and Human Services levy, do they also support public health efforts here in Cuyahoga Absolutely. County? Absolutely. They support all kinds of health issues. Public, uh, you know, we it supports uh, Metro Health. It supports mental, uh, the Adams Board for Mental Health and Addiction Services. It supports everything that is health and human service related in Cuyahoga County. It is critical. It's crucial. If that doesn't pass... As bad as this is today, it could get a whole lot worse. This is the City Club Friday Forum. I'm Dan Malthrop, Chief Executive at the City Club. And uh, as we're in the midst of all the stay-at-home orders and, and working from home, the City Club has moved to a virtual forum format. We're hearing today from Cuyahoga County Executive Armin Budish about the county's response to this pandemic. You're, uh, we're moving to the Q&A, to the audience Q&A, and I, I don't have to say all the usual stuff about keeping your questions brief and to the point and that sort of thing, but um, if you do have a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the program. You can also text your questions to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794, and, uh, and we'll put the question to the county executive. Here's one that, um, that came in earlier today, Mr. Executive. Uh, yesterday, Cleveland.com published an article about the closure of three hotels during the pandemic. This has resulted in the loss of hotel bed tax for Destination Cleveland. What will be the effect on things such as the renovation of the Q, or the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, which was financed in part by hotel bed tax revenue? Well, it affects everything. Um, the the uh, closure of hotels, like any business, uh, impacts, uh, again, impacts as a county government our bottom line. Uh, the biggest tax that we rely on are sales taxes. <clears throat> I mean, you walk down the street, you see the businesses closed. Those businesses are not generating sales, which in turn does not generate sales tax. We're right now doing projections as to what impact that's going to have on our budget, our ability to continue to provide the services that people count on for this community, um, including services like economic development and helping businesses grow and, and attract businesses to Northeast Ohio. Um, the bed tax does support Destination Cleveland, but we also get a portion in the county government of the bed tax. Uh, so in Cuyahoga County, you know, it's, it's interesting because I've had many conversations over the last uh, few weeks uh, with my colleagues, my uh, counterparts, uh, county commissioners and county executives from around the country and around the state uh, about how they're handling things and how the reduction of taxes, the reduction, closing of businesses is going to impact them. I was talking to Franklin County, uh, friends of mine down there. They are impacted much less because they their primary revenue source is property tax. Property tax eventually may get affected, but not short term. It's not like sales tax, which falls off the cliff as soon as something like this happens. So we are in particularly precarious position uh, here in Cuyahoga County, and it's going to affect everything we do. Another question has to do with uh, economic development. You just mentioned economic development funds. On the other side of this, uh, when we when we get to the other side, there is going to be need for economic development stimulus and for picking back up on economic economic development projects. I wanted to give you, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. So, you know, some projects that are out there right now, I mean, we've made a big commitment right before all this hit to Sherwin-Williams to retain Sherwin-Williams in Cuyahoga County. That's not going to change. We've made that commitment. We're staying with that commitment. Um, uh, we have the project right across the street from here, the Lumen Project. Again, we've committed to that. It's, I hope, almost built and ready to open in not too distant future. That's one that we'll stick with. Um, small businesses, though, are the lifeblood of this community. And so I mentioned earlier in the program that we've created a small business fund uh, that will help small businesses get past this. We've we've always invested, used our economic development funds to invest in small business. We do it through partners like ECDI and the Urban League and uh, Jumpstart and, uh, you know, you go through a whole list. Uh, we're going to continue to do that, but we have to have businesses to invest in if we, so that's why we've got to save the businesses that we currently have. Uh, that's the number one priority in economic development now is 
saving those small businesses so that they don't permanently close. Once they're permanently closed, it's almost impossible to revive them. We've got to save them. Another question from our community. In addition to prisoners, uh, this listener is concerned about ICE detainees in various county jails. What are your best ways for releasing these innocent, hardworking non-citizens? You know, I don't know that we have any ICE detainees in our prison, in our jail. Um, uh, they've been, if not entirely, uh, mostly put in other places. I don't, to my knowledge, we don't have ICE detainees in the county jail. I'm sure if that's uh, not true, we'll find out momentarily Maybe. when we get fact-checked. Um, uh, in looking at zip, another question here, in looking at the zip code data, it feels like the east side is harder hit. Is that more about diffusion of tests, more mobile population, data tracking? What do we know about that? You know, it's speculation. It's hard to say. It might be more testing for in that region. It might be that, you know, the hospitals have... Uh, that's where the hospitals have been focusing their testing. Or it could be the populations that are being tested. Um, so, for example, um, I don't have facts and figures on this, but uh, intuitively, it, uh, you know, instinctively it tells me that, you know, there are a lot of health care providers that live around uh, the east side communities that are uh, being um, hit hard. Healthcare providers, you know, they're in the hospitals, they're in the facilities that are caring for people who are ill. They are, they get sick more than others. If you looked at where those people live, I suspect you might find um, a number of them in those areas you mentioned. Do parts of the East Side already have a higher concentration of some of the more vulnerable populations we've talked about? Um, I'm not sure what, when, when you say more vulnerable, there's a lot of seniors, but those people living in poverty live all over. Um, you know, people living in poverty are all over the county, yeah. unfortunately. I mean, you know, we you can look at cities on the east side. There's cities on the west side, too. And, of course, in Cleveland and East Cleveland, I mean, there's people living in poverty all over. We're one of the poorest areas in the, in the country, and that's why we're working so hard to change that. Another question for you, County Executive Armin Budish, and I'll mention again that if you have a question for the County Executive, you can text it to 330-541-5794. That's 330-541-5794. You can also tweet your questions at the City Club, and we'll work them in. Uh, there was another question here, more specifics about loans for small businesses. The federal legislation that passed the Senate has loans that can be forgiven under certain circumstances, such as keeping employees on payroll. Um, are these the loans to which you're referring, and are the loans from the Cuyahoga County Fund forgivable if employees are kept on? Also, you mentioned a mix of loans and grants. How will right. all of that be sorted out? Well, we're still sorting it out. I mean, this has only been a week since we started this project. You know, we've mm -hmm. been moving very fast to try to get money out on the street as soon as possible to these small business owners. So uh, hopefully by next Monday or Tuesday, we'll have all the rules set. But uh, right now, they're still in process. So I'd rather not get out in front of our team. Sure. Is there relief for nonprofits in the county fund? To my knowledge, no. This is uh, focused on small businesses. Okay. Um, I did have a conversation with uh, the chairman of the uh, uh, CAC, the Cuyahoga Arts and, Arts and Culture. Culture. Uh, and uh, talk to her about um, perhaps looking to realign some of their funds to help organizations that otherwise are going through the same thing as small businesses. And uh, I think that there will be something that's forthcoming there. Okay. Um, another question about the jails. Domestic violence perpetrators are being released from jail, according to this question. How will we protect their victims? Um, again, uh, all I can say is that the the judges and the prosecutor are being very careful about who they release. So if, if they perceive someone as a, uh, as a potential uh, or likely um, uh, problem, if they're released, they won't release them. More questions. Uh, is the county involved in placing hand-washing stations and portable uh, toilets around the city for so many homeless who, whose regular places for respite are closed? The libraries are closed, for instance. Um, so with the homeless, for example, uh, we have uh, worked on getting other places open for them to uh, utilize, like some of the uh, hotels. We're working on it. Okay. And, for and this you know, you mentioned sanitizer, you know, et cetera. We've spent a lot of our effort 
trying to get more what's called PPE. Uh, a personal, personal protective equipment. Correct. Um, that is for everyone, but in particular for um, hospitals, for caregivers, for first responders that have to go into places that are dangerous to their health right now. Um, so personal protective equipment includes, you know, the face masks, the gloves, sanitizers, you know, gowns, all kinds of things. Uh, you've seen it on the national news. There's a, news, there's a terrible shortage of personal protective equipment uh, everywhere. Um, we are doing everything we can to get as much of that as possible. So first, we put out a request for donations. Uh, there's uh, groups like veterinarians and dentists that aren't doing, uh, aren't able to do the work that they were doing before. Uh, so if they have personal protective equipment, we've asked them to donate it. Uh, some of the trades, building trades, construction companies have face you know, So we're, we've been getting a lot of donations. We've been very happy with the, with the generosity of people in this community. As you know from your work, you know, it's, we are a generous community. We've always been, and people are really stepping forward now in this time of need. In addition, though, to the donations, we still have almost unlimited need. Uh, so um, just this past week, for example, I was on the phone with uh, colleagues of mine from around the country uh, asking them for leads on where, you know, do you know of any place we can buy more PPE? Uh, and I've gotten some leads uh, a number of leads, um, some of which have uh, not worked out, uh, some of which look like they're legitimate, but they're out because, you know, they're selling, you know, and, and when you find a lead, you've got to act like, you know, five minutes or or you could lose it to the next guy. You know, you're competing with everybody in the country, uh, in some ways, everybody in the world. So uh, we have found some good leads. We have ordered I don't know, right now, probably half a million dollars of PPE from uh, leads that we found. I've authorized another million dollars uh, to, to uh, purchase PPE. Uh, we need to protect our community. We need to protect people who are serving us, people who are protecting us in the hospitals, people who are protecting us in nursing homes, people who are protecting us you know, on the streets with police and fire. We need to protect the people who are working for the county. I need to protect my employees, the people who are seeing people putting themselves in, you know, going into people's homes. You know, we need to protect as many people as we can in this community. The need is almost unlimited, but we're trying to do our best in finding PPE. Are those county employees who are visiting homes adequately protected today? Well, we're doing Yes, I mean, I believe they are today. Um, you know, we're doing the assessing. We're doing the, you know, the, the making sure that before they go in, you know, that there's some questions asked about, you know, what, who they're going to see in there. Uh, but I'd like to do more. I mean, I definitely think we need to do more, and that's what we're trying to do with the PPE. Is the county working to set up emergency hospitals like New York has already done at the Javits Center? We are fortunate to live in a community with really, really good health care and a lot of good health care institutions. So between the clinic and UH and Metro and St. Vincent, you know, and go down the list, um, we have a lot of capacity in the community. Now, you know, those hospitals, you know, run it, you know, they're not empty and are just waiting for this kind of pandemic to occur. They're, you know, they've got a lot of people in there. So if we don't flatten the curve, we could go beyond capacity and then we'll be in a situation like New York. That's why everybody's working so hard to avoid being in that position, to drag out, to limit the amount of people that get sick at any given time so that we have capacity. Uh, the answer to your question directly is right now the hospitals are telling us they're okay. They don't need to have more hospital you know, buildings built or tents set up or anything like that. I have called the CEOs, I've offered uh, the convention center. Right now they've said, we don't need it right now. We'll keep it in mind. Um, some of them have already contacted some of the relatively empty uh, hotels. Uh, to, they, they can use those. Um, so right now I think they're doing okay, but we want to be in a position that if, because this moves so fast, mm -hmm. if you know three days from now all of a sudden there's a huge surge that they do have a place to go, people have a place to go. Does your 
you are, I, I'm making an assumption that you're privy to briefings that the rest of us aren't privy to, although I have to say that the um, that your colleagues at the commission, at the Public Health Commission, and here in Cuyahoga County, Terry Allen in particular, right. and and others, and and your counterparts at the state level, the governor and and Dr. Amy Acton, and others in the governor's cabinet have done very well with communicating in a timely manner, in a routine manner. Um, does it feel to you, and based on the information you have and analysis you've been getting, that we are in fact flattening the curve? That's the view that I have, that the steps that are being taken are helping. Um, I want to say that uh, the governor, Governor DeWine, in my view, has been masterful in uh, handling this uh, pandemic. Uh, I think he's done a great job. Uh, Dr. Acton is extremely good. You see her on TV. She uh, is as good as she is on television, is how she is in she's real life. She's spoken at the City Club a couple of times as well. She's she is a consummate professional and a great communicator. And we have our equivalents here with Terry Allen and uh, Dr. Gullett. So uh, we we are in good hands in Cuyahoga County. Terry Allen is uh, as experienced as you could be in this sort of thing. Um, I think he's been in you know involved in public health for th- more than thirty years. Uh, Dr. Gullett is you know you, you see her and you say oh we have our own. Uh, uh, Dr. Acton. So um, I'm feeling comfortable that our folks are very good. There have been a a few questions about the release of demographic data regarding victims of the coronavirus. And um, and I, you and I spoke about this just prior to us beginning the program, and you and I wanted to give you a chance to clarify the relationship between your office and the Board of Health. So we work very closely with the Board of Health. As I said, they're represented at our uh, Emergency Operations Center, as is the Cleveland Board of Health. Um, uh, and I've been doing briefings with uh, Terry Allen and Dr. Gullett uh, on at least a weekly basis. Uh, but they are separate from us. People should understand uh, we work closely with them, but we don't control them or run them, and uh, uh, the decisions they make are theirs. I think they make good decisions, and uh, and I'm comfortable with what they're doing. This uh, is a question here uh, from our, the, our listening community, and if you have a question, you can get it in by texting 330-541-5794, 330-541-5794. to text your question to us. Uh, not sure if the county is enforcing this or if this is just the state. I have personally witnessed a blasé attitude with regards to the lockdown, the stay-at-home order. What measures are being taken to enforce it and make sure people actually do stay at home? Right now, uh, the governor's answered the same question uh, that's been asked of him by saying, you know, he's counting on people to follow the order for the sake of their own health and the health of their family and friends others in the community. Um, Most people, I believe, are following it. You know, you walk down the streets and then the streets are empty. Uh, So I think people are staying at home generally. Uh, I know that there are stories of bars and restaurants that uh, may be violating the order. If that comes to uh, our attention, we will take action. You know, it, 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 everybody has to follow the rules. You know, we can't have some people following the rules and others not. Restaurants are still permitted to offer takeout. Absolutely. Bars are not permitted to be open at all. That's correct? I believe that's correct. Um, some I questions. Hope that the restaurant part is right because I get takeout. So. <laughs> and I'm sure the restaurants that you're, that you're, <laughs> that you're supporting really appreciate that. Um, there you know, are, and I, if I could just mention, because you know, it's interesting that businesses like the, the City, City Club, Club of- for example, are adapting how they do business. You know, doing virtual forums is not what you've done in the past. Well, you know, this past uh, week or two ago, um, uh, we I went to Edwin's restaurant. Edwin's is a, on the east side at Shaker Square. It It is a sit-down restaurant. Nobody was sitting down. The tables were all gone. They were having takeout. They totally switched to a takeout and Brandon Krastowski, who's the the proprietor, the owner, um, he was saying they're doing very, very well. And it's been a complete change in their business model, but it's because of this virus. 
I received a text message earlier today informing me uh, from my family informing me that we're getting takeout tonight to support <laughs> to, to do the same to support local businesses. Um, and by the way, let me add to that. It's very important that we support local businesses as we can. I mean, it's easy to go on Amazon, and that's good. And Amazon's hiring more than four thousand people in Cuyahoga County. So if you need a job, if you're out of a job, and by the way, I should have mentioned that there is. A website uh, you can go to. Uh, the Greater Cleveland Partnership has on its website a list of the big hiring companies uh, like uh, Amazon and uh, uh, Walmart and some of the others. Amazon's hiring at seventeen dollars an hour, is my uh, understanding. So it's not bad, and uh, so. And I understand uh, the state government is also hiring people to process unemployment insurance claims. They probably are. I, I haven't and heard I that, but I imagine next surprised. week the, the Small Business Administration will be doing the same for people who are capable of handling the small business applica- loan applications. But my point was, Go. where I was going was that it's it, you know although some big companies are you know doing a lot of hiring, we have to be supporting our small businesses here. If if there's somebody doing takeout, if there's somebody doing you know if it's a dry cleaner that does pick up, you know whatever it might be, you gotta try to support your small business, local businesses. We gotta keep them going. Um, earlier in the, there's a, a few questions specifically about housing relief for uh, homeowners, and I know also and renters as well. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to discuss that. It's uh, really important. And I'm reminded that early in this crisis, the city of Cleveland ended, um, you know, it put a moratorium on water shutoffs and, and so forth, and I think electricity shutoffs as well through Cleveland Public Power. Um, can you talk about what's available to homeowners in terms of relief from, uh, from whatever debts they may owe you? Yes. Uh, so early on County in this— government. In this process, I ordered through an executive order that um, we would not do any uh, f- uh, tax foreclosures. We would not do, uh, uh, we would not uh, 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 ding people, penalize people if they were on a payment plan and you know couldn't make their payments of, uh, of their property taxes. So we we uh, did what we could immediately to protect people. We we made a decision. We did not want to throw people out of their homes during this crisis. Um, uh, we don't control uh, private foreclosures like through the banks. Um, I can tell you today, I had a conversation. We've been working with the banks locally. A, a key bank called me this morning and said that they are going to put a moratorium on foreclosures. Uh, they're going to put a moratorium on uh, uh, on evictions. Uh, so um, the banks, at least Key Bank has come through. I'm optimistic the other banks are uh, looking at the same Certainly thing. good news. From our partners over at Global Cleveland, can you share how you're reaching out to our English as a, sec- as a learning language community for our immigrants and refugees? Yes. Um, if you look at our website, uh, f- the, the, the sites that I've talked about that help uh, the community, we've now got those multilingual uh, so that um, people who, have, uh, who, who don't speak English well can follow it in, in their native language. And do those who are answering the phone at various helplines have access to translation services? I think so. Uh, I'm going to check that now that you've asked me that question. We okay. did add translator for the public uh, sessions we're doing with the Board of Health and others. I, I, I will check that and make sure. I believe that's the case, but I don't want to miss misanswer. Um, finally, in just a, a, a few a, a minute or two, could you talk about economic development on the other side of this? The, there's a major project the county is in, uh, was re- working on RFPs for the microgrid um, that sounds, I, I don't even understand how big it is or, or anything like that, but I would imagine it's a, it, it entails quite a lot of jobs. I think the microgrid is the most transformative uh, activity that we've been involved in, uh, that I've certainly been involved in. It would, uh, it, the project it would basically uh, provide very, the best, most reliable uh, uh, electric power of any city or county in the in the country. Um, uh, it's and right it would be now focused on downtown and university circles. Right, right now, at the location is downtown. There's a large geographic area downtown. Mm-hmm. We would be the largest microgrid in the country. Um, it would guarantee 99.999 percent reliability, which is the highest level possible. It means that even if there's an earthquake or a hurricane or a cyber attack. Businesses connected to the microgrid would be guaranteed they would not be down for more than five minutes in a year. That would be a key to attract businesses from all over. We've done studies. 
Uh, Cleveland Foundation has helped fund some of these. The CSU and Case have helped us with it. It is huge. It does sound important. And we don't. We're almost out of time. There's. It's privately funded. It's. It would not require uh, county, county money. Cuyahoga County Executive Armin Budish has been our guest for our virtual Friday forum today, Mr. County Executive. I thank you so much for your time for being a part of this. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. Special thanks to PNC and the Center for Community Solutions for their sponsorship of our virtual forums. The Center for Community Solutions reallocated their annual sponsorship to support our virtual forums just this week. And we really, they, they hope this contribution will inspire others to join them in their commitment to the City Club. We thank them for their generosity. We thank PNC as well and many others. If you would like to join them, you can find us online at City Club. Dot org. As the county executive has said, we can only do this with the support of our very generous community. These virtual forums are also sponsored by the Western Reserve Area Agency on Aging, the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland, and EverStream. Additional support is provided by many generous members, sponsors, and donors that you can find at cityclub.org slash thank you. We're going to continue to present our forums throughout this time, either on Zoom or here from the studios of WCPN IdeaStream. You can join us on Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. on Zoom as we talk about the federal stimulus bill with Amy Hanauer, Executive Director of the Institute of Taxation and Economic Policy. If you have other ideas about topics or speakers we should feature while we all learn to shelter in place, please get in touch. You can find us at cityclub.org. I'm Dan Malthrop. Stay strong, stay healthy, stay close in your hearts if you can't stay close in person. Our forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.